So we have these, the, 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 the symmetry that says the laws of physics are the same wherever you want in space, and that has three degrees of freedom, x, y, and z. Time is just resetting the clock. That's one degree of freedom. So time now, as opposed to tomorrow, you do Galileo's experiment tomorrow at noon, two masses that are different, you drop them, they fall at the same rate. Or you do the experiment next week, of Tuesday at midnight, and they'll fall at the same rate, and they'll fall identically. That's one degree of freedom, the time. Orientation in space, three rotations. And state of motion, we call boosts. We can boost the system by giving it a relative velocity to us in any of three degrees of freedom. And here comes Noether's theorem. For every continuous symmetry in nature, there's a corresponding conservation law. For every conservation law in nature, there's a corresponding continuous symmetry. In other words, these symmetries are in one-to-one -one correspondence with dynamical, measurable, physical quantities. And those physical quantities never change for any large experiment that, that itself isn't changing, a hermetic experiment. So for example, space translations, three degrees of freedom, corresponds, that symmetry corresponds to the conservation of the momentum. The fact that the laws of physics do not change in time corresponds to the conservation of energy. I don't mean by conservation of energy reducing your energy consumption, which is always a good thing. I mean that the total initial energy in a phys closed physical system, no matter what happens, no matter what forces are involved, pions interacting with nucleons, quarks interacting with gluons, atoms forming molecules, whatever, the total energy will be the same after as it is before. If we rotate the system in space, that's a symmetry, and that corresponds to the conservation of something called angular momentum. If we put the system in a different state of motion, we find that we actually have to talk about a generalization of angular momentum, which has its own three degrees of freedom called relativistic angular momentum. And that's, that's a bit tricky. So I, it, it's tricky because actually in classical physics, it's always zero. It's very hard to observe the consequence of this. But, uh, it's generally a, a, a part of angular momentum as a, concert, as a statement of relativistic conservation of angular momentum. <coughs> How do we prove Noether's theorem? Well, you prove it by counterexample. Actually, there's a formal way of proving it using what we call the action principle, the Grangian dynamics, calculus of variation. It's very sophisticated. But you can get the drift of the theorem very easily. Let's suppose we have the Acme Energy Company power company. And they have, it's based on the discovery of some inventor that Tuesday mornings uh, at 10 a.m., gravity is 10% weaker than it is for the rest of the week. At 10 a.m., suddenly gravity becomes 10% weaker. It stays that way for a while. If you come back Wednesday, it's gone back to its normal value. And the inventor invented a G meter that measures gravity and made this discovery. So, the Acme Energy Company is formed by a bunch of investors, and they float stock, and they go public, and they start, a lot of people start buying the stock, and the investors, the, people, the insiders who started it are very wealthy, because what they're going to do is build a power company. They're going to have a water turbine generator, and they're going to pump, on Tuesdays at 10 a.m., they're going to pump water up in a water tower. That costs them energy, which is minus the mass of the water times the value of little g on Tuesday times the height of the water tower. And then the next day, Wednesday, when G has gotten bigger, they're going to drain the water out of the tower, and they're going to get back energy M times G on Wednesday times H. And the G meter says on Wednesdays that G is bigger than it is on Tuesdays. And so they've gotten energy from nowhere. They got a net energy gain of M G Wednesday minus G Tuesday times H. And this is a tremendous breakthrough. It solves the world's energy crisis. And the company's stock immediately starts going up. You know, countless widows, orphans, and people start investing in this. And stock brokers get in it and so forth. And then suddenly, hush, hush, the inventor flees the country. Can't be found anywhere. Popped a red-eye flight somewhere into 
some obscure place. And lo and behold, the insiders in the company had already sold all their stuff. And the uh, universal testing laboratory has tested the gene meter and is about to announce the results. Well, you know, the week before something like that, the stock goes up, then it goes down, then it goes back up, and it oscillates wildly. Finally, Monday morning, the UTL has its public announcement that says, we have discovered a flaw in the G meter. It turns out that Tuesdays at 10 a.m., the nearby town of Batavia tests its air raid sirens, fearing an air raid. The acoustic vibrations of the noise in the air causes the G meter to read a false result, 10% lower. And then it takes about a day for the spring to relax back to its normal value. So G Tuesday, G Wednesday minus G Tuesday is actually truly zero. There is no net energy gain. Energy is conserved. Now, this is, you know, facetious, but this happens all the time. Uh, it happens all the time on Wall Street. It happens that people are, are making this mistake right now with corn ethanol. They're putting more energy in than they're getting out. When I was a graduate student, there was a company that made, in California, that made uh, motorhomes. And uh, motorhomes were very popular back then. And suddenly they announced that they could break water down into hydrogen and oxygen. And a little bit later, they could combine the hydrogen and oxygen and, and, and it would burn and you would get energy out and they could they would get a net energy gain and you could fuel cars this way. And in particular, you could now haul very big motor homes across the country. You see, that was when gasoline was first starting to go up in price. And I came in to Caltech's theory group that morning and Richard Feynman was in a really excited state. And he says, how can I short every share of stock in this company? Because it's based on the false premise that water molecules are somehow different in the future than they are today. Otherwise, energy is conserved. You won't get any energy out. I actually went to lunch with Feynman that day and we talked about you couldn't, the Security and Exchange Commission had already suspended trading in the stock, but you could buy put options. They had, for some reason, suspended that. And I looked it up, and sure enough, we could buy put options. The stock had gone from a dollar up to $20 a share. If we bought put options at 20, the stock would go way back down, and we'd make an enormous profit. That was the theory. And I was explaining this to Feynman. He said, this is great. Let's do it. What do we have to do? And I said, well, we've got to get some forms from the broker to get permission to trade puts. And he said, oh, forget it. I'm going to go back and do, do my physics. Well, it turned out that was the right thing to do. Because even though this was a complete scandal, and this company was simply in violation of the law of energy conservation, the stock never really went back down. It sort of drifted down a little bit. But we would have never made any money off these put options. So while the law of energy conservation and the invariance of the laws of physics in time applies to physics, it doesn't apply to the stock market. But these scandals happen all the time, and total misunderstanding of of the energy budget of a system. is It's very easy to get confused because there's so many ways energy can leak out of the system. I mean, think of a car. When you're driving down the highway, yes, you're moving the car, but you're also heating the engine, radiating energy and heat. You're compressing the tires, which get hot. You're radiating energy that way. There's, of course, aerodynamic resistance. There are all these, there's noise. You're making sound. That's energy. All this energy is radiating away from the system. And so, if, if you're not careful, you'll think somehow you're, you're, you're losing a net amount of energy or something. It all balances out. The total energy that you're starting with in the fuel is equal to the total energy that's produced, motion plus all the losses.